Hello everyone, Austin Peterson here, former presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. Today is Tuesday, March the 7th, and today I've got a, a story that I have just loved reading the, from the Wall Street Journal that I am really excited to share with you all. And, and I've kind of switched up the title because I think it's a little bit more appropriate, maybe it's a little bit more clicky, get you to actually get in here and have a listen to what I have to say today. Uh, but this is an opinion piece from the Wall Street Journal which really caught my eye and it was called The Exhaustion of American Liberalism, with the subtitle of White Guilt Gave Us a Mock Politics Based on the Pretense of Moral Authority. And it's an absolutely terrific article that came out a couple of days ago that I wanted to share with you all. Just an FYI, if you're wondering where my video live streams are, uh, at the moment my computer is uh, a little bit out of, it's out of shape, it's, it's busted. Uh, but thankfully uh, we had an anonymous donor step in and um, who has offered me a computer that's going to be in the mail here pretty soon. So my video live streams will resume uh, as soon as I get my new hardware. <clears throat> and the good news is that I'm pretty sure that it's going to be powerful enough for me to dual live stream both to YouTube and to Facebook. Um, if you're listening to this later on uh, Podbean, or if you're listening to this on iTunes or on Stitcher, for example, then uh, you'll you'll uh, just so you know we do actually do video live streams every Monday. Wednesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Central Time, and those will resume uh, most likely next week when I've got the new hardware. Uh, but if you're noob and you didn't know that, I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of um, <clears throat> of that 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 was going on. So yeah, so I'll be back on the Freedom Watch fighting for liberté on my Liberty live streams uh, as soon as I get the new hardware set up. But uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks, big shout out to the anonymous donor who uh, provided us with the equipment so that we can keep on broadcasting. Oh, so it's audio for now. And uh, uh, yeah, so today let's get right down to the topic. Let's talk about this, about this topic of white guilt, because um, I'm going to add my own commentary that, to this as well. But I thought this piece was just absolutely terrific. Uh, so I wanted to share with you all. This is by an author by the name of Shelby Steele. And she wrote in the Wall Street Journal that the recent flurry of marches, demonstrations, and even riots, along with the Democratic Party's Spiteful reaction to the Trump presidency exposes what modern liberalism has become, a politics shrouded in pathos. Unlike the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, when protesters wore their Sunday best and carried themselves with heroic dignity, today's liberal marches are marked by incoherence and downright lunacy. Hats designed to evoke sexual organs, Poems that scream in anger yet have no point to make, and hysterical anti-Americanism. Terrific opening line. Thank you, Shelby Steele, for pointing that out. All this suggests lostness, the end of something, rather than the beginning. What is the ending? America, since the 60s, has lived through what might be called an age of white guilt. We may still be in this age, but the Trump election suggests an exhaustion with the idea of white guilt, and with the drama of culpability, innocence, and correctness in which it mires us. White guilt is not an actual guilt. Surely most whites are not assailed in the night by feelings of responsibility for America's historical mistreatment of minorities. Moreover, all the actual guilt in the world would never be enough to support the hegemonic power that the mere pretense of guilt has exercised in American life for the last half century. White guilt is not angst over injustices suffered by others. It is the terror of being stigmatized with America's old bigotries, racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. To be stigmatized as a fellow traveler with any of these bigotries is to be utterly stripped of moral authority and made into a pariah. The terror of this, of having, quote, no name in the street, as the Bible puts it, pressures whites to act guiltily, even when they feel no actual guilt. White guilt is a mock guilt, a pretense of real guilt, a shallow etiquette of empathy, pity, and regret. It is also the heart and soul of contemporary liberalism. This liberalism is the politics given to us by white guilt, and it shares white guilt's central corruption. It is not real liberalism in the classic sense. It is a mock liberalism. Freedom is not its reason d'etre. Moral authority is. Oh, isn't that brilliant? And I just want to pause here for just a moment before I go on because, you know, 
I, I saw an interesting segment with Bill Maher a few weeks ago, and I, I know a lot of libertarians and conservatives don't care for him, but I, I do. I think he's pretty funny, and um, you know, I like to listen to people that I disagree with. And and Bill Maher, uh, there are quite a few things that he says sometimes that that I totally agree with. He he actually calls out liberals frequently for things like this. And uh, you know, he had Milo Yiannopoulos on his show recently to give him an opportunity to speak his mind, and you know, he's spoken out against the the censorious nature of liberals and um, and and the nature of radical Islam, which many liberals give a pass, uh, and, and even some libertarians give a pass to, uh, and, and frankly, you know, it's illiberal. Um, but I thought it was interesting because, uh, you know, Bill Maher, in, in many ways, is sort of like considered with a prototypical American liberal, and yet he, even he has uh, expressed his disgust over the, the new form of, of white guilt that we have in America. And he said something that I thought was really interesting, which was that, you know, we made a mistake, the liberals made a mistake in the way that they demonized John McCain and Mitt Romney because, you know, they called Mitt Romney a racist, a fascist, a, a bigot, you know, a homophobe and a sexist, you know, because of his, you know, binders full of women comments and things like that. But then they take a look at Donald Trump and they realize, you know, Don, Bill Maher says, you know, we made a mistake. You know, in a, in a sense, he admitted that the, the liberals have created Donald Trump, you know, the, 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 the king of anti-political correctness, Donald Trump himself. I mean, in many ways, Donald Trump absolutely was a reaction to the American, uh, to the American liberal movement, which is that you know, which called everybody that disagreed with you a racist or a bigot or homophobe. I mean, I saw that the girl, um, what's her name from, um, from Game of Thrones was saying, you know, something, she was kind of echoing, I believe, Gl Gloria Steinem was like, if you're not a, if you're not a, a feminist, then you're a sexist, right? Is it, it's just that there's no middle ground, right? In essence, the liberals have adopted uh, the George W. Bush style of rhetoric. If you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. And it's just that that's really what's led to the rise of the radical right and the, the rise of the alt-right as well, which is what the second point I wanted to bring up before I move on uh, was the question of people like Richard Spencer. I mean, the real white nationalists, you know, the, these are the people who are a response to the uh, hysteria on, of the American left. I mean, think about that. That is really, that's true. That's what happens, is that, is that there, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh-oh, the politically correct police are outside. The Kansas City PC police are on their way to get me. Sorry, if you can hear, if you can hear, the, uh, if you can hear the sirens outside. I, I live in a loft in downtown Kansas City, so it, it does tend to be a bit noisy sometimes. Last night, we had a big, huge hailstorm. It was pretty, pretty crazy loud, uh, wicked loud, actually. I thought they were going to break my windows because we had um, you know, pretty strong hail, severe hail. But anyways, back to what I was saying was that, uh, you know, the alt-right is, in essence, it's a reactionary movement. It, 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 is, it is a movement that is a response to the hysteria of the American left. And, uh, and I think it's funny because, because it, it, in a sense, you know, the liberals did create that. They created the, the enemies that they, that they so despise now. And they say, oh, now look, because of their extremism, look what they have wrought on the United States. I mean, it's it's absolutely true that the that the poli that politics works like a pendulum, right? That you get you swing one way too hard, and then you swing the other way even harder. And so, when you think about it, I mean, that that is what's happening here in the United States today. That the, the entire Donald Trump movement is is a reaction to the hysteria of the American left. And that's why we have the alt-right today. That's, where, that's why we get these reactions. That's why the Gary Johnson approach uh, during the election of going after the leftists and the burnouts was, was the wrong move because the pendulum was swinging to the right. And so the only way to head off a more extreme movement of you know, alt-right you know, type of conservatism uh, would have been to have a libertarian, uh, libertarian movement that captured that energy and the desire to fight against the ex extremism of the left Right, but um, but no. Instead, we decided to bake the cake. Um, yeah, whatever. Salty, really. Salty tears. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, yeah, I won't sing that sublime song, but it's a fantastic song if you don't know. Big salty tears. Anyways, <clears throat> show show. Back to the Wall Street Journal. When America became stigmatized in the '60s as racist, sexist, and militaristic, it wanted moral authority above all else. Subsequently, the American left reconstituted itself as the keeper of America's moral legitimacy. Conservatism, focused on freedom and wealth, had little moral clout. From that followed today's markers of white guilt. Political correctness, identity politics, environmental orthodoxy, the diversity cult, 
and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Diversity has become a cult. I, I think diversity is a good thing, but I think mandatory diversity, such as the liberals have tried to instill in the United States, is a sincere it is a cult because again, it it places lot you know diversity above logic. I mean, it, it, it not above logic, but I would say above merit, right? And libertarians very much believe in a meritocracy. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept of a meritocracy, a meritocracy is you know um, it, it, it sounds like a nasty word, but uh, it basically is a, a society that thrives based on merit. Um, and yeah, that can that can come off somewhat as Darwinian. I, I like to think it more as Randian. But yes, we should reward people based on the merits. I mean, isn't that really what? What Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about when he says, I look forward to the day that my children will be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. That's, that's merit. That's a meritocracy. And, and that's really what we should have is people based on their merit. You know, I, I tend to be colorblind. And, that, and that's really what, what separates me from people in the alt-right and things like that, that that place so much value on race. Uh, I don't really place much value on race. I don't look at people in the, by, based on their genders or their race. I look at people based on their individual merit. I think that that um, essentially the, the extreme right and the extreme left are collectivists, right? That, that That's really what racism is. It's just an ugly form of collectivism. But the, the new anti-fascist and the new you know anti-racist movements, I mean, they are very much collectivists as well. They are very much racist in their own right. And, and that's where that's where the libertarians come in, because we don't really fall in that. I mean, people consider us extremists. But like I've said recently, you know, if I mean, if being an act, if loving your country, you know, loving the Constitution, believing in individual liberty and in a world where gay married couples can defend their marijuana fields with fully automatic machine guns, if that makes me an extremist, well, then fine, I'm an extremist. But I mean, if you take a look at the types of ideologies that are in power today in the United States, I, mean, I think that libertarians are really a, a much more sane middle ground. I mean, it, it will, because we, again, we don't look at people in groups. We look at them as individuals and we judge them based on their merits. I mean, isn't that just logical? Isn't that just logical? I mean, that's really what it should be. It, it, it should be based on the, on the merits of the individual. That's what I really believe in. And I, I think that, that compared to, again, the major philosophies that hold power today, I think that that's fairly reasonable. I don't think that that's extremist at all. It's just that, you know, because of the way that the Overton window is right now, people look at libertarianism as, as extremists, um, mostly because, our friend, because we're a smaller group, so our fringe element tends to stand out, right? So, like, the, the craziest voices tend to be the loudest and the ones that people pay attention to, you know, like the naked dancing guy on stage or, or, you know, unfortunately, you know, Gary Bacon's Johnson is, is, you know, what people are going to look at and think of as libertarianism today. So we haven't had the best leaders in our movement. And I'm actually going to read a really good um, article for you all later today, which I think a lot of you are unfamiliar with. If, if you're interested in a kind of like Inner, inner libertarian politics, and we're going to talk about the laws of the public policy process at the very end of this live stream as soon as I'm, I'm finished with this so that you all can have a, uh, a better concept of what, just what it is that we as libertarians, if you're a libertarian, what it is that you, um, <clears throat> what it is we should do in order to ha enact the, the type of discipline that we need to change the public policy process. So I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to get back to the death of American liberalism just because it's fun to pick on liberals, right? Um, so the diversity call, right? So this was the circumstance in which the innocence of America's bigotries and dissociation from the American past became a currency of hardcore political power. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, good liberals both, pursued power by offering their candidacies as opportunities for Americans to document their innocence of the nation's past. I had to vote for Obama, a rock-ribbed Republican said to me. I couldn't tell my grandson that I didn't vote for the first black president. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, like, you couldn't tell your own grandson that you've stood up for what was right, despite the fact that, yeah, I, I mean, that's cowardice to me. That's absolute cowardice. For this man, liberalism was a moral vaccine that immunized him against stigmatization. For Mr. Obama, it was raw political power in the real world, enough to lift him, unknown and untested, into the presidency. But for Mrs. Clinton, liberalism was not enough. The white guilt that lifted Mr. Obama did not carry her into office, even though her opponent was soundly stigmatized as an iconic racist and sexist. Perhaps the Obama presidency was the culmination of the age of white guilt, so that this guiltiness has entered its denouement, which if you're not, if you're not a theater nerd like me, denouement means like the falling action. Uh, so, so white guiltiness, white guiltiness 
has entered the end of its, of its course. There are so many public moments now in which liberalism's old weapon of stigmatization shoots blanks. Elizabeth Warren in the Senate reading a 30-year-old letter by Coretta Scott King, hoping to stop Jeff Sessions' appointment as Attorney General. There it was, with deadly predictability, a white liberal stealing moral authority from a black heroine in order to stigmatize a white male as racist. When Miss Warren was finally told to sit, there was real mortification behind her glaring eyes. Ooh, God, can't stand that, guy, that lady. This liberalism evolved within a society shamed by its past. But that shame has weakened now. Our new conservative president rolls his eyes when he is called a racist. And we all, liberal and conservative alike, know that he isn't one. The jig is up. Bigotry exists, but it is far down on the list of problems that minorities now face. I grew up black in segregated America, where it was hard to find an open door. It's harder now for blacks to find a closed one. This is the reality, uh, this is the reality that made Miss Warren's attack on Mr. Sessions so tiresome. And it is what caused so many Democrats at President Trump's address to Congress to look a little mortified, defiantly proud, but dark with doubt. The sight of them was a profound moment in American political history. Today's liberalism is an anachronism. It has no understanding, really, of what poverty is and how it has to be overcome. It has no grip whatever on what American exceptionalism is and what it means at home and especially abroad. Instead, it remains defined by an America of 1965, an America newly opening itself to its sins, an America of genuine goodwill, yet lacking in self-knowledge. This liberalism came into being, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this liberalism came into being not as an ideology, but as an identity. It offered Americans moral esteem against the specter of American shame. This made for a liberalism devoted to the idea of American shamefulness. Without an ugly America to loathe, there is no automatic esteem to receive. Thus, liberalism's unrelenting current of anti-Americanism. Let's stipulate that, given our history, this liberalism is understandable. But American liberalism never acknowledged that it was about white esteem rather than minority accomplishment. 4,000 shootings in Chicago last year, and the mayor announces that his will be a sanctuary city. This is moral esteem over reality, the self-congratulation of idealism. Liberalism is exhausted because it has become a corruption. Brilliant article. I think I would nitpick a few things here and there, perhaps the, the, uh, the charge that um, Donald Trump is a, a conservative. I don't really see Donald Trump as a conservative. I see him much more as a progressive Republican in many ways. Um, probably more of a populist than anything. He just probably does what he thinks is going to be the most popular policy in order to be popular. I mean, that, that's tempting. I cannot tell you how many times, being a politician as I have been, running for office, the temptation was to tell people the, the tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. <laughs> and, and, and that, like, I was just so tempted to not tell people the truth because I knew that it would be politically unpopular. It kind of reminds me of the time that these, you know, these college liberals in 2008 came to the Libertarian Party's office and, and I read to them from the road to serfdom in cartoons and at the very end of the, of, the, of the reading, they all looked at me with horror in their eyes because, of course, at the end of Road to Serfdom, the state plans your execution. So it's a little grisly there at the end and the liberals look at me and they're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, excited to see Obama be inaugurated, et cetera, et cetera. And then the first question with their jaws all again, they look at me after having read Hayek's Road to Surfed with me. They're like, so do you think Obama will be a dictator? And I froze. And I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to respond to this? How am I going to respond to this? I'm going to be pissed. And I just looked him right in the eyes and I just go, yes. <laughs> and it's raw. I mean, they were pissed. They were so angry at me. And, you know, I, I could have probably saved my butt by saying, well... You know, actually, not really a dictator, right? Not like Mussolini or Hitler. <laughs> I could have been all mealy mouthed, right? And, uh, but but that's not what wins elections anymore, ladies and gentlemen. That is not what wins. You know, people want the people seem to want those hard truths <laughs> from from uh, Donald Trump. Right? The anti PC police are now out in full force. I mean, did you see the base stick man the other day? A guy cracking that commie over the skull with a stick. Uh, that is that if that isn't the per personification, if that isn't the a perfect metaphor for the reaction of the conservative and uh, and some of the libertarian movement to the um, <clears throat> to the the communists and the antifa the, the the hardcore left 
it, I don't know what is. I mean, that guy cracking that with his America flag, cracking skulls, is a is a perfect personification of what has is happening in American politics today. People are absolutely sick of commies. They're tired of these of these riots by Antifa. They're tired of the, of the Black Lives Matter protests that go nowhere and that and that encourage and incite violence against police. They're absolutely sick of it. You know, and uh, again, I'm not a conservative, right? But it's really hard to to watch that video and not be like yeah, bro, crack a commie skull for me. I mean, it's very hard not to sympathize after having been browbeaten for so long and uh, by the American liberals and being told that we need to feel this sense of, of, of white guilt. Yeah, I'm watching the comments. Tamara Wells, if you haven't seen the base stick man by now, guys, you got to watch it. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's really hard not to smile when you see that commie get cracked over the skull. And it's kind of funny because there's a guy with a uh, an anarcho-capitalist flag right next to him, an ANCAP flag. And uh, the guy with the ANCAP flag, <clears throat> um, was, was he got his nap violated for sure. Um, was he defending himself? Well, you don't have to just be defending yourself, Eli Bowman. Uh, actually, you can be defending other people and hit him over the head with a stick. And that dude was coming out with swinging. You could see that the guy in the green, in the green, um, uh, sure, the guy who got cracked over the head was coming out with his with his fists up, coming out punching. So yeah, absolutely. If you come out with if you come out with your fists up, bro, then yeah, I'm gonna bring the stick of the radical stick of liberty on top of your head. So uh, kudos to the base stick man for taking down a few commies. We, he didn't, I guess he didn't have his um, he didn't have his uh, helicopter nearby. We can't all afford helicopters for for communist removal, guys. We got sometimes you got to rely on a on a, a, a bit of balsa wood and uh, and a, a shield with an American flag on it. Anyways, <clears throat> so yeah, we got to uh, we got to move on. We got to move on. Uh, let's take a look at the laws of the public policy process. Now, this is a big issue because some of you guys know we've got a Freedom Ninja group. It's closed group and uh, you know there's a lot of complaints because sometimes people troll in there and it's it's actually a group where we discourage trolling and we discourage fighting you know a debate is perfectly fine in the freedom ninja army but uh but we try and make it a positive group an uplifting group try and help one another it's really sort of a mutual aid society and we get we do get drama in there from time to time and people are like austin you gotta you know ban this person block this person yeah if if i banned or blocked every single person uh, that comes through the uh, that 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 trolls or does something stupid in the group, everybody would be gone. If I banned everybody that everybody said to be gone, everybody would be banned. But so so you got you got to have a little bit of a of a. Uh, it's not an open borders policy. It's more like an Ellis Island approach. So it's not extreme vetting, but we do vet people before they get before they can join the uh, Grand Ninja Army of the Libertarian Republic. It's the Freedom Ninja Army group. <clears throat> but you know sometimes people screw up big time, and uh, and I think it's because the the Liberty libertarian movement and the reason why the libertarian movement has not been successful is because we lack discipline and we don't we don't like discipline right we don't like rules we don't like being told what to do right that's that's kind of the libertarian thing but if we want to be a cohesive movement that actually advances public policy towards a libertarian direction then we're going to have to learn some lessons and i have got a terrific i've got a terrific uh, uh, list from a buddy of mine, a guy by the name of Morton Blackwell, who founded the Leadership Institute, which is a part of the American Conservative Union, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, but they do a lot of good work in training conservatives and libertarians on, on campus. And, and they don't just hold themselves out for just conservatives. They are the conservative union, but they are very uh, helpful to libertarians as well. They don't reject you if you're a libertarian. They actually do have a lot of libertarians who work there. Shout out to Patty, Peppermint Patty, Patricia Simpson, and, and all the other good people who are doing good work at the Leadership Institute. So if uh, this, this isn't a plug for them as much as just saying, hey, this is a good place for you to go to get training so you can learn more about the public policy process. But there are um, there are 45 rules here in the laws of the public policy process, and there's quite a few. I'm not going to be able to get into each and every one of them. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and drop the link there for you guys so you can see it and read it later. But this is the kind of stuff that we're going to need to absorb. Uh, and if you guys came for the, the American liberalism story, then we've already gotten through that. So this is more like inner libertarianism stuff. <laughs> But um, but yeah, this is a really good uh, this is a really good rule book for you guys if you actually want to be effective. So let's go through these. I won't be able to extrapolate on each one, but I think that it, uh, each one deserves a read. So the laws of the public policy process. Number one, never give a bureaucrat a chance to say no. Number two, don't fire all your ammunition at once. Number three, don't get mad except on purpose. Very good. Number four, effort is admirable achievement is valuable. 
Number five, make the steal more expensive than it's worth. Number six, give them a title and get them involved. And I use that one quite frequently. I do get a lot of people who want to volunteer for like the Stonegate Institute or people who want to uh, intern for uh, the Libertarian Republic or write for Liberty Viral. And not everybody can get paid just because we're not a huge operation. If I change my name to the Conservative Republic or the Republican Republic or something like that, I could probably make a lot more money and, and all that just because we've got a stigma involved. But, um, but no, I'm trying to bring the Libertarian movement up. So, uh, so I'm sticking with the Libertarian Republic, guys. <laughs> but, but give them a title and get them involved. What that means is it's, you know, give somebody an intern title, give somebody an associate editor title and things like that. Then people feel like they've got some responsibility and then get them involved so that they're doing something they really like and care about. And I could tell you a whole long story, but just very briefly, when I worked at the Libertarian Party, we had about 12 empty computers, no interns. And I turned that office into a powerhouse of activism while I was there. And, I, and, you know, inspired the activism that, that created a, a thriving internship program. And uh, unfortunately, in the years since I've left, they've, they've allowed it to um, diminish or defenestrate or what's the word I'm looking for. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but when I was there, that was a, a very powerful uh, tool for me in order to get young people involved was to give them a title and get them involved. Number seven, expand the leadership. And we do that in the Grand Ninja Army of the Libertarian Republic in the, in the Freedom Ninja Army group. You know, we have a group of admins and uh, those, are the, those are considered the officers officers, right? That's the officer's core. And those are the people who, who, who administer the, the group, who, you know, kick out people who are being abusive or hostile um, or who are breaking the rules of the group, which is, you know, pretty simple, which is, you know, don't be a jerk. You know, be, be, you know, be kind to one another. You know, don't post screenshots from the group outside of the group. It's perfectly fine to post screenshots from outside the group in the group, but we try and keep things internal because this is a place, it's, it's kind of like a training ground. Think of it as like our little dojo. It's where we go to train with one another and we don't hurt each other, but we do, we do sometimes spar and it's a place for us to learn. Um, and so we have a, a growing, thriving leadership in that group. And uh, that's a good thing because those people, I think those officers are going to be big, lead, big time leaders in the libertarian movement in the future. Some of them already are. Number eight, you can't beat a plan with no plan. Absolutely true. Number nine, political technology determines political success. Very, very true. Number 10, sound doctrine is sound politics. Number 11, in politics, you have your word and your friends. Go back on either and you're dead. Very true, man. I can't tell you how many people um, have uh, I've had to turn my back on because they've gone back on my word, th their word to me, or they've you know betrayed me or something like that. And you know, in some ways, their their careers are are dead in the water because of that. But you know, it's it's a difficult thing, politics, and losing friends over it is not fun, but uh, it does sometimes happen. Number twelve. Keep your eye on the main chance and don't stop to kick every barking dog. That's probably one of the hardest things for libertarians because we do get our we do lose sight of the goal frequently and every single time somebody starts to troll us, we send in the, you know, send in the dweebs to go in and, and do the fighting with the dweebs and the, you know, then they drag us down. They, it, you, when you argue with idiots, they drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. Right? So you don't stop to kick every barking dog. Or my, my old friend Judge Napolitano used to put this another way. He would say, you know, if a dog barks at you, do you bark back? Of course not. So don't lower yourself to their level and don't don't respond to every single threat, accusation, or all that. You know, there, there were so many times during my presidential campaign when people would just make stuff up about me. They would just make an accusation, right? And you can't disprove a negative, right? So they would just say, well, Austin, how do you respond to this? And it's like, why would I respond I'm not going to respond to that. It's it, Responding to that would give it credit. There's a really good um, version of that with, um, for example, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, it's rumored that when he was running for Senate against this guy who was a, a pig farmer, that they wanted to accuse him of bestiality, that Lyndon Johnson wanted to accuse him of, of having carnal relations with his livestock. And when his campaign manager or advisor was like, well, he's like, he's like, I can't believe that you want to do that. I mean, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, do you how, do you expect anyone to believe that that he would actually do that? And Lyndon Johnson said, reportedly said, no, but I want to hear him deny it. I think about that. Right. So you don't respond to every single attack. You just can't. It's a waste of your time and energy. You, you should really only respond to the types of attacks that you think are actually going to be doing any kind of damage to you. So again, if you see somebody being an idiot online and they're just trolling you, you know, just block them. 
You know, just block them or ignore them. And that, that's the best way to deal with people like that because, again, all they want to do is suck up your productive time and energy by arguing with you and rolling around in the, in the pig pen. Now, I made a mistake with that, actually. Now, I'll tell you the one time that I made a big mistake. Probably one of my biggest uh, mistakes in my political career was the time that I went to go argue with Christopher Cantwell. Uh, and I had the high ground there, right? I was arguing against him because he did a really scumbag move. Um, and then I got, I rolled in the pig pen with him and I got an insult battle and I said some bad words and people use that against me later. Right. So now I have to answer for it, even though it was just some stupid argument. Right. And who hasn't said bad words in an argument? Uh, but when you're when you're in politics, these are the things that can hurt you. So again, don't 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 lay down and, and, and wrestle with the pigs. And just like I posted yesterday, that Bible quote is don't don't throw your pearls before the swine. Uh, which is um, another big argument. <clears throat> so, uh, next argument. Uh, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. That's another big one that libertarians really have a problem with. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, right? It's just like, oh, he's Rand Paul's not perfect. He's not a libertarian. I hate Rand Paul. Boo-hoo, you whiny babies. Shut up. I mean, he's definitely the best senator that we have. Yes, we should hold him accountable when he does something that's not libertarian. But, God, to run, try and run him out of the movement. I mean, I saw somebody yesterday was complaining about me. They were like, they were like, Austin, he's such a Republican because he doesn't say bad things about Rand Paul. And it's like... Yeah, why would I say th bad things about Rand Paul? I mean, like, what has Rand Paul done that really has has set our movement back? I mean, you guys, you got to have a little bit of relativity, relativity, and you got to have some objectivity, or otherwise, you're just never, you're just never going to change the public policy process. You're just never going to change the public policy process. It's not going to happen. So you've got to change your attitude on this. And again, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um. Number 14, my lucky number. Remember, the other side has troubles too. Number 15, don't treat good guys like you treat bad guys. This is another perfect one for libertarians. Don't treat fellow libertarians the way that you treat statists. Don't treat fellow libertarians the, the way that you would treat Marxists and commies, right? If you treat like the people of your group the way that you treat people in your outgroup, that is a recipe for disaster. Right. Like if you have a problem with somebody in the libertarian movement or liberty movement and you just want to go out there and go off half cocked and start attacking them and all that kind of stuff, you're probably only going to hurt yourself. You may not see that right now, but it's true. And you should always try and give your friends and your allies the benefit of the doubt. Right. It's like it's like being involved in World War One and World War Two or for something like that and being like, oh, well, Britain, you know, screwed up. So now we're going to attack Britain. You know what I mean? No, don't don't stab your allies in the back. Number 16, a well-run movement takes care of its own. You know, some of us know the story about what happened recently to someone in the libertarian movement, and I won't say the name, but, um, you know, they were outed publicly, and it became a big deal. And, uh, you know, we, we did our best to the, the Freedom Ninjas to take care of our friend because that's what we have to do. I mean, I would hope that if something bad happened to me that there would be people who would take care of me, and there have been. There, you know, there have been people who have come to our defense, and we need that. We need a mutual aid society as libertarians because if we do not hang together, we shall most assuredly hang separately. So we have got to take care of our own people. We've got to stop throwing each other to the dogs. We've got to stop destroying one another because that, that's, that's what it is, is that we now take people like Julie Borowski. Like, look at the comment sections on Julie Borowski, who is an angel. I mean, she is a delightful angel. I mean, what does Julie Borowski do that should be controversial to anybody in the libertarian movement? And yet many people in the movement hate her and try and destroy her. And, and, it, and it just makes me sick. Uh, so take care of each other, people. We, we have got to do that, or we are never going to have a cohesive movement. Hire at least as many to the right of you as to the left of you. Absolutely. And uh, I try and do that as well. Actually, the Freedom Ninja Army group doesn't have any sort of a, uh, of a real ideological test. I mean, other than, like, don't be a, a Nazi and, you know, you know, be like, oh, burn the Jews and stuff like that. So, so yeah, there, you can go a little too far to the right and a little too far to the left. But uh, for the most part, we don't really have any ideological tests in order for you to be a member of the Ninja Army. You just have to want to come, obey the rules, be, be good to each other and learn from one another and, and be productive. And that's the thing is I never liked echo chambers. I actually hated echo chambers. So let's say that um, <clears throat> two years from now, in, in an alternate reality, Austin Peterson is a United States senator, right? And I have to build my office. 
Well, I'm going to put good libertarians in the policy positions, but I think it's important to have people in there that are going to call BS on you sometimes. Like I have a friend who works in environmental policy, and she's a flaming liberal, and she's always calling me out on, on certain things on environmental policy. She's much more educated than I am, and I like to have her around. I like to hear what she has to say because I learn things from her, and it actually sharpens my arguments. It hones my arguments. So, so I, again, just like the Ninja Army, it's not, a, it's not an echo chamber. It's very important for us to expand our knowledge by bringing, by surrounding ourselves, not by people who just are yes man, people who just tell us what we want to hear. But it's important for us to bring people on who disagree with us because you know dissent is one of the highest forms of patriotism, and and uh, you know we just can't be always right all the time. You just can't, and uh, and you know that's why it's important for you to be able to have an open mind and be able to change your mind. Moving on, moving on. Um, <clears throat> you can't save the world if you can't pay the rent. Boy, is that true. I'll tell you what. <laughs> there were a couple of times, there have been a couple of times during my activism in the last seven or eight years when I was like, I was like, dang, I'm poor. <laughs> well, fighting for liberty is, is, the, is the kind of job, thankless job that, you, you know, you don't make a whole lot of money. I, I, that's why there's actually a lot of temptation on the, on the people in the liberty movement to join the alt-right and to, you know, sell out to Trump because, you know, if you get a drudge link, then you're going to be a rich man, right? And, and you know, drudge, drudge, um, it was he does he didn't share links from people who weren't pro Trump. That's why you get like the info wars on on Drudge Report because there's there's a financial interest right. There's a pecuniary interest in selling out. There just absolutely is, and that's why it's really it's really difficult for libertarians to kind of make a living fighting for freedom and fighting for liberty. Just because you know we need institutions. We absolutely need institutions. You know that's why I built the Libertarian Republic and Liberty Viral and, and the Stonegate Institute in, in part because we need to give libertarians good libertarians jobs like I, I know that libertarians don't like make work and we certainly shouldn't be you know unproductive but we absolutely need institutions that can hire libertarians so that they can do the job of freedom fighting that's why it's that's <laughs> freedom farting sorry um, that's why it's so important for us to it's so important for us to build these kinds of institutions. I mean, in part, that is why I wanted to build the Libertarian Republic, because I want to build a thriving libertarian news uh, empire that can build, that, that can create jobs for libertarians and, and advance the movement. It's very important. Moving on. Uh, all gains are incremental. Some increments aren't gains. Number 20, a stable movement requires a healthy reciprocal IOU flow among its participants. Don't keep a careful tally. So that's the thing is that you got to kind of pay it, pay it forward, right? So it, a, a reciprocal, healthy reciprocal IOU flow, right? So we don't keep a tally, right? Like I did this for you. Now you need to do this for me. But I mean, it, it's always good to pay it forward, you know? And I've certainly been blessed with um, a lot of support from activists, especially over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, for example, the other day, you know, Eric July contacted me and, and he's like, hey, Austin, you know, I've got a new CD out. And it's like, it, you know, it cost me nothing to, you know, usually people approach me and they want me to share stuff and it's like, you know, they'll be like, okay, and I'll pay you for that, right? So it's like an advertising deal because that's, you know, that's just what it is. When you get to a certain size online, like you get like Julie Borowski and, you know, she probably makes pretty good money selling merchandise, t-shirts and, and things like that, right? And that's usually as a, when you get to be um, a pundit or whatever like that, then you can make good money for, for um, promoting people's content. But, you know, Eric July is, you know, I don't think he's like a really rich man. I'm sure if he was, he would have offered me money, but, but he asked if I would promote it. And I absolutely did because it's important to do that. I mean, if you, if you're in the position to do that and you can, I mean, that's, that's the thing with libertarians, I think is too often is that we're, we're, we're pretty selfish and, and I'm not saying we need to be, you know, to be altruistic. I know that the Randians are going to kill me right now, but when you get to the top, you know, throw the ladder back down, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in situations where libertarians who had power over me, you know, I did everything I could to help them. And then when it came time for them to turn around and do the same for me, they didn't do it. Right. They didn't do it. Some some because, you know, they just didn't want, you know, another libertarian to have the limelight for whatever reason or they just, you know, maybe they just changed their opinions on me for whatever reason. You know, maybe I'll give them better for the doubt. But when you make it to the top, guys, throw the ladder back down to other people. Give them a hand. Give them a hand up. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't make money doing what you're doing, because this is this is actually how I make my money right now, which speaking of here's a little advertisement. If you guys like my make taxation theft again hat, uh, you can get that and other cool swag at threads of liberty dot com. That's threadsofliberty.com. It's the AP collection. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, that's how I make my money, too. But, you know, I'm not a greedy pig. So, if people like Eric July and they need to promote stuff and it's a good cause, then, yeah, you know, sometimes you do it for free. And that's important. We as libertarians have got to help each other out sometimes and promote one another and help each other's causes, especially if we think it's a good cause. And that's how I think we're all going to grow. Um, moving on. An ounce of loyalty 
an ounce of loyalty is um, is worth a pound of cleverness. Number 22, never miss a political meeting if you think there's the slightest chance you'll wish you'd been there. Number 23, in volunteer politics, a builder can build faster than a destroyer can destroy. I would, I don't know if that one is true. <laughs> Not in the libertarian movement especially, because it seems as if the destroyers in the libertarian movement can destroy so much faster than people like myself and others can build. But we can debate that one later. Uh, number 24, actions have consequences. Number 25, the mind can absorb no more than the seat can endure. Number 26, personnel is policy. Number 27, remember it's a long ball game. Number 28, the test of moral ideas is moral results. Number 29, you can't beat somebody with nobody. So you've got to be somebody in order to beat somebody. Number 30, better a snake in the grass than a viper in your bosom. That's true. Keep the snakes away from you guys. That's why we do have a policy of removing people from the ninja army if they're destructive. Number 31, don't fully trust anyone until he is stuck with a good cause which he saw was losing. So there, ladies and gentlemen, number 31, don't fully trust anyone until he is stuck with a good cause which he saw was losing. So if that isn't my support for Gary Johnson, <laughs> still the very end last year, if you don't think uh, if, that you can trust me, ladies and gentlemen, then... Consider number 31 on the laws of the public policy process. Like, don't fully trust anyone until he's stuck with a good cause, which he thought was losing. Um, yeah, that's me. All I've ever been, had is lost causes, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to have a few wins. Wouldn't you like to see some wins of the Freedom Ninja? <laughs> right, absolutely. Oh, Yasek Spindel. How's it going? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, international Libertarian right there. Uh, Sasha Hudson and Todd Joe, welcome to the live stream, a audio podcast. If you're listening to us later uh, on iTunes or Stitcher, thanks so much for subscribing. We do sometimes do these audio live streams on Facebook. So if you haven't if you haven't subscribed to us on Facebook, you can find us uh, facebook.com slash producer Peterson, P-R-O, uh, you know, producer P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. If you don't know how to spell my last name, what are you doing, guys? Come on, come on. Uh, <clears throat> anyways, number 32, a prompt, generous letter of thanks can seal a commitment which otherwise might disappear when the going gets rough. Very true, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you letters. Very, very important. Number 33, governing is campaigning by different means. Number 34, you cannot make friends of your enemies by making enemies of your friends. Number 35, choose your enemies as carefully as you choose your friends. Number 36, keep a secure home base. Number th and that's the ninja army for sure. Number 37, don't rely on being given anything you don't ask for. Number 38, in politics, nothing moves unless pushed. Number 39, winners aren't perfect. They made fewer mistakes than their rivals. Yeah, I know people are asking for the site to the, uh, the Liberty Schwag site. It's, it's, I'll, I'll go ahead and drop it in there. It's threadsofliberty.com collections slash collection slash the AP collection. Right There you go right there. Boom, boom, boom. So you guys got it in there, so you can get some cool swag. So yeah, this is this is literally how I make it make my living, guys. So any merchandise that you buy right there is like that is my personal uh, rev income right there, and that's that's where I um, that's how I'm able to continue to do what I'm doing right now, which is try and spread the ideas of liberty and grow our, our liberty movement. So I would sincerely appreciate if you uh, <clears throat> if you uh, made a contribution through getting some cool swag. We'll be adding some new merchandise there pretty uh, pretty soon. I've just been uh, behind the eight ball. I'm actually working on a book. I think you guys will be really excited about this, but I'm actually working on a book right now. And uh, I think you guys are really going to like it. It's it's I'm I'm pushing to try and get it out by this summer, but man, it is a big bear of a task because I'm actually I'm working on so many things right now. But I'll tell you this, um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll read you the, uh, the first four paragraphs. Would you guys like to hear the first four paragraphs of my book? As soon as this is over, if you're still here, I tell you what, if we still got at least 100 people on the live stream when this is over, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and read to you all the first few paragraphs of the opening to my new book so you guys can get a little treat. So try and keep it up. Keep sh share the, um, share the uh, Facebook page or share this live stream right now so that we can keep it up over 100 viewers. And if we do, then I'll read you guys um, a, a little sneak preview of my new book. So uh, do me a favor. So share this, share this live stream, share this podcast, and that way you guys will get a, a little treat. If not, then no, no, no. So, uh, so yeah, so I think that that's, that's reasonable and fair. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, in uh, number 39, winners aren't perfect. Perfect. They made fewer mistakes than their rivals. Absolutely true. Number 40, one big reason is better than many little reasons. 
Number 41. In moments of crisis, the initiative passes to those who are best prepared. Number 42. Politics is of the heart as well as of the mind. Many people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Isn't that so true? I mean, we as libertarians, we sometimes get accused of being cold-hearted, and sometimes we can be. It's like, oh, we don't care about this, or we don't care about you or your feelings and all that kind of stuff. You know, you, we have to convince the American people that the reason that we want liberty for the American people is not just for our own selfish needs, but because we care about other people. I mean, that's what I am fighting is, is not just for my own freedoms, but for the freedoms of, of my family and my friends and the people that I love. I mean, I fight for liberty because I, I truly love this country. I really do. I love America. You know, and, and, and I love I love liberty and I and I love I love the American people. I mean I've I, I very rarely across the United States, very rarely do I run into people that I really just despise or hate. You know, on the internet you it's completely different, right? But where all the trolls come out. But but for the most part, I mean America's full of good people. It just really is. And that's why I think that these people deserve liberty. They deserve freedom. And we've got to convince the American people of that or else we're we're not gonna convince them that our, our solutions are the um our solutions are the right solutions. We have to convince people that we are that we are trying to do what's best for the American people. So politics is of the heart as well as of the mind. Many people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So very very sincere uh, sentiment there, and one that we we as libertarians would do well to to mirror in our um, <clears throat> in our approach. Okay, almost to the end. Do we still have a hundred? Do we still have a hundred viewers to the live stream right now? Uh, we do a little bit, just barely. But I'm almost to the end. And if you guys, if we still got over a hundred, then we will. Uh, you'll get a little sneak preview. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Number forty-three. Promptly report your action to the one who requested it. Number forty-four. Moral outrage is the most powerful motivating force in politics. Sad, but true. Number forty-five. Pray as if it all depended on God. Work as if it all depended on you. Terrific. Terrific. Absolutely terrific. Well, it looks like we are still over 100, which is good news for you guys. So you're going to get to hear uh, a little sneak preview of my book. This is from the opening. And I'm only going to read to you half of the opening. Keep in mind that this hasn't gone through the editor just yet. We're still working on it. Uh, but I'm, um, I'm about I'm almost finished with the first chapter. And uh, I think you guys will like it. The, the, the <laughs> so just not safe for work tag here. I'm going to say a bad word. But, but the name of the first chapter is... Uh, bake the goddamn cake. <laughs> and maybe I should uh, consider trimming that back, but I think it has the, the type of impact that I'd like to have with the opening of the book. But this is from the, um, the preface to the book, and um, there's all kinds of exciting things happening with this book, which I can't tell you just yet, but I can give you a sneak preview. I'm authorized to do so because, hey, it's my book anyway. But here, So here it is. Um, and again, I'm only going to read half of it for you, so, um, so you, will get, uh, a little bit of, um, you will get a little bit of a tease here. On Memorial Day 2016, I conceded defeat for the Libertarian Party's nomination of President of the United States. With tears streaming down my face, I handed over a prized possession of mine to the winner, Governor Gary Johnson, a replica of George Washington's flintlock pistol. It was a gift to the victor, a show of chivalry that I had planned for months to hand over, which would be a symbol of my respect. Johnson accepted the gun and then promptly threw it in the trash. Running for president isn't something you tend to do in a fit of passion and spontaneity. But in 2015, after it became clear that my preferred candidate, Senator Rand Paul, would fall to Trump, I threw my hat in the ring. I figured if Trump could be president, anyone could. Looks like I was right. 2016 may have been the best and worst year of my entire professional life. The struggles and sacrifices of reaching for such a brass ring have taken their toll in my thinner, grayer hair. But I don't regret it one bit. I made mistakes, but I paid my dues, and am stronger with my new battle scars. And after all the battles I went through, I've lost friends and former allies, but Providence allowed me to keep two important things, my dignity and my gun. And that's a sneak preview there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, for listening to my live stream this morning. You're all wonderful. And uh, wow, what a terrific response. I mean, you guys are fantastic. And, you know, all of the shares and comments and support from this community has just been so wonderfully uplifting. Lots of big news coming, lots of secrets. Uh, you know, Austin Peterson and the Chamber of Libertarian Secrets going on here in Kansas City. Uh, we've got a major event coming up first week of June. I'd love for you all to join me out at Stonegate Farm for a big party. Uh, we're going to have a major announcement that week. And uh, the 
the future of the liberty movement, I think, is uh, people who are interested in that would, would, uh, would be delighted to attend. Of course, we will live stream it, but there will be nothing like being amongst your fellow ninjas, sitting around a campfire at Stonegate and discussing the future of our cause. So I hope that many of you will join me there. If you like the uh, cool swag that you see me wearing from time to time, I love to wear my Mac Taxation Theft Again hat, guys. If you, do, if you guys haven't heard... I love to wear my Make Taxation Theft Again hat around in town. And people just, they, they crack up because they usually they read it. And a lot of times, you know, people aren't Trump supporters. So they think it's a Trump hat and they kind of give you a dirty stare. And then they read it again and then they kind of laugh. And it's a good conversation starter. So if you haven't gotten your hat yet, you can get it at threadsofliberty.com. Check that out. It's the, um, it's the, uh, it's the great, it's a, a really good conversation starter. Also, we've got it in a, in a shirt form as well as the famous quote about uh, the gay married couples in the marijuana field. So you can get that there as well. And it goes to a good cause, me. <laughs> <laughs> help help me uh, support my activism and my, and my fight for liberty because, you know, you don't get rich doing this, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, maybe you shouldn't get rich, but uh, maybe one day it would be nice, you know, after, maybe after this is all is, all, all is over. But um, I really appreciate you all supporting me and uh, keep an eye out for what's coming. We've got big announcements coming uh, in June, first week of June, which you all, I think, I think you guys all kind of suspect, you kind of know what may be coming. But if you don't know, then maybe you guys can just keep the secret for a little while. Austin and his Chamber of Secrets. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of liberty afoot here in the state of Kansas City, in, in the state of Missouri, in Kansas City, where I am from. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to this. You can subscribe to the Freedom Report podcast, the audio podcast, on iTunes or Stitcher. It's just the Freedom Report. Also, if you guys want to do me a favor, this is totally free. If you, if you have iTunes and you go to iTunes and you look up the podcast, just do me a favor. You can go give it a five-star review. That helps bump me up in the search results. A five-star review on iTunes is the kind of thing that, you know, takes you five seconds. And if you really love me and you want to write a written review and say, oh my gosh, Austin Peterson's Freedom Reports are awesome, then that's also really helpful as well. And you guys are fantastic. Anyways, Freedom Ninja Army, out. Have a great day. See you later, guys.